evening from, uh, uh, from wherever is it that you're, you're, you're tuning from. So welcome again for the ANOC and IOC joint meeting on uh, the uh, sustainability. It's an introduction to the United Nations Sport for Climate Action Framework. Uh, is sustainability, as those of you who were in Crete, uh, is a priority for all of our world and the uh, sports movement and the Olympic movement should take action and do this, do, do its part. So we are very pleased to see so many of you uh, joining this meeting today. Uh, today, we're going to have Ms. Julie Duffus, so the Sustainability Senior Manager from the IOC, speaking to you today about the particularities of the UN framework, uh, what you need to know, how to prepare yourself to join. And after, we're going to hear from Ms. News Homeguard, Olympic Solidarity uh, Senior Project Manager, who's going to speak a little bit about their Olympic Values Program from which the NOCs can take advantage to, um, to, to apply for projects and put their uh, uh, plans and activities into action with financial support from Olympic Solidarity. Uh, just before I hand the floor to, to Julie, uh, we ask you all to leave your cameras open. We want this to be a very informal meeting and also very interactive. So uh, you are, please feel free to ask questions through the chat or uh, using your microphone. During the meeting itself, we ask you, well, while Julie or Niels are speaking, we ask you to turn off your mics and only turn it on when you want to intervene with a question. Uh, we remind you that we do have French and Spanish translation available. So you can click on the little globe on the bottom right and choose your preferred language. So again, feel free to ask questions at any time and enjoy the meeting. So uh, Julie, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gustavo um, and Andres, and welcome to this webinar. And thank you very much for so many of you joining us this morning or this evening, wherever you are in the world, um, thank you very much. It's very heartening to see so many of you online today. The purpose of today is to talk you through the UN Sports for Climate Action Framework. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and why it exists. I'm going to talk about what it is, the main objectives. Can I ask that everyone just goes on mute? Thank you. Uh, the, the principles that are around the framework and the targets, how to join, and then some steps to take before you join and some steps to take after you join. And then Niels and I will talk about supports and how we can support you all within this process. So basically, if we look at the history, and um, sorry, before I start, I'd just like to say, I, I very much want this to be an interactive session. Normally, I would speak to you all on a one-to-one -one basis, um, but it's we've had so many of you interested in this that we decided to do this webinar. However, please interrupt me at any time, uh, put your hand up or put questions in the chat, and we will go through um, the questions then and there. Thank you. So a little bit about the history. So first of all, why? Well, I think I'm gonna talk a little bit just as an introduction on climate change, but I'm sure that we all know now that climate change is a reality and it really is part of our lives, unfortunately now. Not only are we being impacted ourselves, but actually the sports that we love are also being impacted. However, Sport is also part of the problem. We cannot deny that we also have a carbon footprint. On the plus side, though, sport has many unique factors um, and sport is so global and sport has such unique opportunities to really show the world that we can make a difference, that together we are a very strong sector and together we can unite communities around the world to take more action. So this stands us uniquely from any other sector, I think, in the world. 
So when was this framework launched? It was launched at COP24 in Poland, which was in December 2018. The IOC co-launched it with the United Nations Climate Change, who are UNFCC. And since then, we've had almost 300 sport organizations have become signatories. So this is um, really amazing. It's I think the fastest growing framework signatures that we have ever seen. So it's it's fantastic. And we hope by the end of this, all of you will be encouraged to also join. Uh, just a little bit about the how. Um, the UN Climate Change brought a few of us together in sport together to discuss the need for a framework specifically dedicated to sport. And this is what this framework is. It has been set up only for sport organizations. No one else can join. Um, and then we co-wrote and launched the framework together. And the UN are really doing a lot of engagement and advocacy to, to really get more sporting um, sport organizations to join this framework. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the what in a minute. So just to go back to the why and the global context for climate change, we've had two big steps forwards um, within the last year. The first one is the IPCC report. This was launched in August. This is basically the scientist telling us what is going to happen to our world if we carry on like we are. There are some very scary um, prospects coming out of that report. And then we had COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is run by the UN Climate Change and it is where world leaders from all over the world come together, together with experts, and they really dictate the way that they're going to tackle climate change from a government perspective. So coming out of those two, important milestones in climate this year. We've seen on the right here, really the main stories that are coming out of those two things. First of all, climate change is widespread. It's affecting almost every country in the world. Of course, there are some countries, especially within our Olympic movement, who are suffering a lot more. Um, it's rapid and it's intensifying very, very fast. And they have, the scientists, have said that unless there are immediate, rapid and large scale reductions in the greenhouse gas emissions, limiting our warming to close to 1.5, um, we will not be able to get back. We will not be able to be in a place where we can turn around and bring the world back to as we know it today. So at two degrees, and I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about what these degrees mean, but at two degrees, we are talking about entire nations within the Olympic movement will literally disappear. A lot of island nations will disappear. Um, we'll see some countries which have such extreme heat or such extreme flooding that sport may not be able to happen and people may not be able to train in those countries anymore. If we look at the way that we are currently on track, if we carry on the way that we are as of today, we are looking at a three degree scenario. So what I've said to you about the two degree scenario with whole nations disappearing, imagine what will happen at three degrees. At around about four to 4.5 degrees, basically we will not be able to inhabit the planet and we will wipe out every species that is currently on the planet. So a lot of people think that, you know, what does one or two difference in, in temperatures really mean? Well, it's kind of that scary. We're not talking about a better summer here and there. We're talking about some major changes to our planet. And the scientists have predicted that all of this is going to happen within the next 20 years. So in 20 years time, we may be in a situation where we have wiped out most of our species on the planet. So pretty scary stuff. Um, here's just a, a quick diagram. I'm not expecting you to go into this, but this is just to show you in December 2020. So this was a year ago. We were at, we were, 
Sorry, could everyone go on mute, please? I can hear someone talking. Thank you. Um, this is just to show you how we have intensified our temperatures throughout the last few decades. We are currently at 1.18. So that was a year ago, in fact, so this needs to be updated. So we are rapidly reaching the 1.5 and 2 degrees scenario. So what does that actually mean? I put a few statistics down here. I'm not going to go through all of them today, but they're here. You, we will share the slides with you afterwards so you can take your time to read it. But we're looking at um, the differences here between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. So at 1.5 degrees, we will see the sea levels rise twice as much as they currently are. And at two degrees, it goes up to 56 centimetres, so a huge amount. And considering that's around about eight out of 10 of our major cities are on the coast, we're looking at potentially losing a lot of those cities. At 1.5 degrees, um, the marine heat waves will go up 16 times. <laughs> and at two degrees, 23 times more marine heat. So at 23 times more marine heat, most of the marine life will be wiped out. <clears throat> for 1.5 degrees um, and 2 degrees, you'll see the statistics here for extreme rainfall. So a lot of the, the planet will face extreme rain, rainfall scenarios and droughts, by the way. Category 4 and 5 storms will become more common. Um, as I said before, we're going to be losing a lot of habitats. And this is just an example here of mosquitoes. Now, malaria is one of the most dangerous um, issues around the world. It kills more people than many other diseases, um, way more than COVID-19, for example. Now, at 1.5 degrees, we will see a 20% increase in mosquito ranges, and at two degrees, a 30% increase in mosquito ranges. So um, you can imagine how bad that will be. The World Health Organization um, has predicted that drought will displace 700 million people by 2030. That is just around the corner. Um, and then there are a whole load of other issues, such as how we grow crops um, and how we really tackle a lot of the health threats that will face us. <clears throat> so if we're talking about impacts, um, with climate change, there are direct impacts of what I've just been talking about on the left, but then there's indirect impacts and how that those changes really affect society. So here we're talking about the infrastructure, the economic damage, the health, and this is where really sports should be there too, because that is where we're going to see a lot of impacts, um, not just in the health, but also the infrastructure, the infrastructure damage. So here I've just listed some of the issues that we're already seeing. So these are not um, necessarily in the future. These are ones that we're witnessing now and that are impacting sports. There's athlete health, of course. Um, it's um, considering air pollution, extreme heat, extreme water heat, et cetera. Um, we're seeing more increased injuries to players for these, play, um, for these reasons. But we're also seeing a lot of damage to playing surfaces and infrastructure. So a lot of changes are happening to happen. A lot of cancellations are happening in sport because of these extreme um, weather. But as I said at the beginning, we are also one of the problems. So why? Why are we a problem within sport? Well, we do have a footprint. I mean, all of us do as people. In fact, we all have a footprint, but particularly in sport, we, of course, like to fly. We like to buy things like sport equipment and apparel. Um, we like events, obviously. That's why a lot of us exist. And of course, the Olympics, we all love the Olympics, but it is a very big event and it has a very big footprint. However, um, the good news is that we can do something about it. It's not too late and we can protect our sport for the future. So what do we need to do? Well, I think the first thing, and that's why I said at the beginning, it was so heartening that I see so many of this call. The first thing we need to do is to really come together as sport communities. Now those almost 300 signatories that have joined, 
are from all different sizes. I mean, we have some big, big um, organizations in there like FIFA, for example, and also the organizing Paris, Tokyo, Beijing, LA have all joined as well. Um, but we're also seeing really small little local clubs. So these are the little local clubs that you have in your towns that may only have 10 members. They have also joined. And this is what's really nice in that sport is uniting and coming together um, to tackle climate change. So we've got to come together. We need to make a start. It doesn't matter if we're at the beginning. Most of us um, are at the beginning, but we need to just make a start start to measure and start to plan and part of that of course is reducing but also educating and using the influence that we have as sport so what exactly is i've spoken already about the why why i've spoken why they the united nations set up um, this dedicated framework for sport but what exactly is it well it's a framework which has two very clear objectives the first objective is to achieve a clear path for the global sports community to combat climate change. And the second objective is to use sport as a unifying tool to drive climate awareness and action among global citizens. So this is really using our platform to incite change within every single one of your communities. And this is what we're really, really good at. So what um, exactly is it? Well, it's a framework, as I said, that brings sport together, however big or small, through dedicated working groups where we can all learn from each other and to make collective decisions. Now, this is important to note because when the framework was first um, launched, it didn't have a clear set of targets. And the point of that was because the United Nations wanted sport to come together and create targets for ourselves. And that is basically what we have been doing for the past two years since it was launched. And we have just um, released the targets, which I will go into in a little bit. But the framework also builds a concrete and ambitious plan of action. So it will take you every single step of the way through your entire climate journey from being really the first thing that you do at the very beginning stages all the way to um, where you're a climate positive, hopefully, organization. And the UN and all of the signatories, almost 300 signatories, are here to support each other and I've really seen that and it's very nice to see and it's very nice to have that platform where we can discuss and support each other throughout our entire carbon journey. So we're almost at 300, maybe after this call in the next few weeks we'll get to 300, that would be very exciting. So to go back to really the far overarching principles, these are the actions that you will need to take once you've joined. And it's based on five principles. The first one is to undertake systematic efforts to promote greater environmental responsibility. The second one is to reduce your overall climate impact. The third one is to educate for climate action. The fourth one is to promote sustainable and responsible consumption. And the fifth one is to advocate for climate action through communication. Now, I'm not going to go into exactly what all of this means, because that would take an hour probably on itself. But the reason why I've put up this picture on the right is because this is actually an online guide. Um, it's on our Internet. So I think it's on Knocknet as well. And this will explain a lot more detail about exactly what these five principles are and what you need to do to implement these principles. You'll see when you read the text, there are no dedicated targets in there because they've really left it up to us to decide because all of us are so different, especially with NOCs. You all have different um, sizes and different things that you're responsible for. Some of you have events, some of you don't. And so the point of these principles is for you to decide how you're going to implement all of these five actions. 
So regarding the targets, um, this is a really key point of what you need to remember, because now the targets have been set, all new signatories have got to commit to these targets, and all existing signatories who weren't party to these targets at the beginning now have from until May next year to sign up to these targets as well. So the targets are a 50% reduction in your carbon footprint by 2030, net zero by 2040. We have a, um, a commitment to monitor on a yearly annual basis and also to report publicly on that and then to advocate and help raise awareness within our communities. So regarding the 50% reduction, it might sound very scary to some of you. Um, I would say that actually it doesn't and the consequences of climate change will be a lot scarier. Um, it is possible. We've gone through the whole process at the IOC and we committed to these reduction targets um, just before COP, so, so a couple of months ago. We went through the whole process to make sure that it was possible. It is possible, of course, it, it may, means a bit of a change in the way that you operate, but actually we've seen over and over and over again to those IFs and NOCs who have already joined that actually it makes sense to them, it saves them money, um, a lot of them are getting increased sponsorship because of it, because of the way that a sponsor is seeing that you're being a responsible organisation and the benefits are actually coming in quite strongly. So those are the targets. And how, how do you go about joining this? I'm just going to stop there for a second to just check I don't have any questions on the actual framework itself. No? Uh, not yet, but uh, okay. once again, we encourage everyone to ask questions and you can use the chat or just let us know. Uh, we want, as Julie said, uh, to try to, to have this as interactive as possible. So thanks everyone and please feel free. Great, thank you. So what should you do before joining? Um, I've basically created this. It does not, you don't need to take these actions if you don't want to. I'm just trying to make a pathway for you, for those of you who are um, a bit unsure about what actions to take. So these are steps which I thought you could take before you join. I think the first one is to really just spend some time to understand about climate change. Read and watch as much as you can. Um, there's a lot out there in the internet, whether it's documents or videos um, on social media. There's a lot of talk out there about climate change at the moment. I think number two is really get to understand your NOC. I'm sure all of you do already, but it's quite easy, good, I think, a good practice for when you come to measure your carbon footprint to really map out what your NOC does, how big you are, whether you have events, are those events annual, are you entirely responsible for those events, how much do you buy, all of that will need to be calculated eventually within your, your carbon footprint. And I'm not going to discuss today about scopes, but basically you need to decide, and we're here to help you in this, but you need to decide exactly what is within your carbon footprint and what you're including in that. And then I think understand more about the Sports for Climate Action Framework. There's some documents that you can read and we can share, share all of this with you after this call. Understand the reduction targets and the monitoring requirements. The monitoring requirements are relatively simple and we are definitely here to help you on an annual basis to complete those monitoring requirements, but they're nothing for you particularly to worry about. The second stage is to engage your whole NOC and your top management, um, your board members, staff and stakeholders. This is important because the thing with climate change is that it's everybody's responsibility. It's not just the responsibility of the person who is really championing this within your NOC, it's everybody's responsibility and you need that engagement if you're really going to, to reach these targets. Third step is to actually become a signatory. That's funny enough, quite an easy part. You just need to sign a letter 
um, and send it to the UN. Um, it needs to be signed by the presidents of the NOC as well. Now on the right, I put these two steps in a dotted line because it's completely up to you. You could do these two before you join the framework or you could do them after you've joined the framework. It's really up to you. But at some stage, you need to actually measure your carbon footprint and you need to create what's called a baseline so that you know how to reduce and what you're measuring, um, reducing that 50% by. So that's a very important step, but you don't have to do it before you join the framework, um, but you can do if you want. I would say out of those um, signatories that have already joined, most of them have not actually measured their carbon footprint until after they've joined because they wanted to be part of the working groups, see the documents that are on the SharePoint for the framework and see what other people in sport organisations are doing and what help they can have. So a lot of people only measure their carbon footprint after they've joined. And then you need to create a carbon plan and implement it. So this is where you work out exactly how are you going to reach that 50% target? Um, who are you going to advocate to? Who's in your community that you can incite action? All of that needs to be in a, a carbon plan. It could be just one page if you wanted it to be. It doesn't have to be a great big encyclopedia of everything to with carbon. Um, it can be very simple. It's just the plan of how your NOC is going to implement this framework. For some reason, my computer has frozen. Um, Gustavo, can you? Yeah, do you want to try to unshare and share it again? <clears throat> Yeah. While I'm doing that, any questions? I see some some have popped up, but I can't read what they are. Not yet the question. Yeah. I see. Ah, yes, we have some question in French. Can you help out, Andres? Uh, yes, so we have Ahmed asking where and how to find the framework documents. I guess that was the question. Mm -hmm. Correct me if, if I'm wrong. Um, so there's, there's a couple of options for finding. One, we will email it to you after this seminar. Two, in the guide which I talked about before, which is on olympic.org and not net, you will see the, the framework, the links to the framework and the letter that you need to sign within that. Or if you just type into Google UN Sports for Climate Action Framework, you'll, you'll be directed straight to the UN dedicated website page. And there they have all of the, um, all of the links to the documents. I don't, Andres, maybe you could, um, I can't do it because I'm sharing my screen, but we can maybe put in the link in the chat to yeah. the friend's website. I think um, Ivan friends. Liu already yes. <laughs> worked with us. Yes, and helped as well. <laughs> Thanks so much. We have some help. Then we have a question from Mast uh, from Morocco. Like, how do you calculate the carbon footprint of an NOC? Um, I think it's a quite complex one. Uh, yes, so, well, there's several steps to that. I would say one, we will help you on a one-to-one -one basis, so you won't be alone. We can guide you through every step of the way, but basically what you need to do is collect data that you have within the NOC, um, and then you need to put it onto a online tool, and then basically it does everything for you. But we will send you a list also of some online tools. They're free. So you can um, play around with them. It, it doesn't matter. You can do it several times. They're just free online tools so you can go through them. Also, coming out within the next week or two, I'm going to send you all a document, which is basically these steps in a Word document. But an annex to that 
is a table which will have all of the data that you need to collect to input into that and make your carbon footprint. So it sounds a lot more kind of work than it actually is. I think the, the hardest part is actually collecting the data and deciding on what your scope is. So when I say deciding your scope, it's do you have events? If you do have events, do you have direct control over those events? Or is it better that actually you put maybe a clause in your contracts with those events for who is organizing them, for them to measure their footprint? So these are the kinds of things that you need to think about. You also need to look at your procurement and how much um, of that, how much stuff do you actually buy? And that will also need to go into the, the calculation tool as well. So I haven't specifically gone through the step by step on how you take the measurements, because I think that needs to be a whole nother seminar on its own, but very happy to to do that at some point. We will be doing it next year anyway. But for any of those who want to do it sooner, then I think the best thing is to contact me directly and I can talk you through it on a one to one basis. Perfect. And then, well, we have one more, uh, uh, what do you say, organizational question from Mabel because she has to leave if we will also make available this recording, which if everybody's happy to, we will also share it together with all the documents that Julie and yes. Niels will mention. And just to finish, before we go ahead, we had a follow-up question of Ah Ahmed. Sorry if I pronounce it. Uh, Broadly, um, is asking more about the process of the letter again. If if they also have to send it to their local um, UN offices, no. So there is a dedicated website. Um, sorry, email address. It's called Climate Dialogues. It only needs to go there. That's the only place. I think if you sent it to your local one, they might not know what it is. I don't. Well, no. Assuming they do, if it's UNFCCC, but no, it's just one website. Uh, we just ask that you copy um, myself and Niels in um, but just to make sure that we can then push the UN to make sure that they have listened to your to your email. So that's it. You don't need to send it any, any, to any local organization. Perfect. So, for, for, so far, we are good with questions and we can continue. You are also free to raise your hands if you want to take the floor personally, just, just so everybody knows. Great. And um, can you see my slide now moved on? Yes. Great. <laughs> okay. So this is just a slide on steps once you've joined. Now, it may be um, that you've already done your measurements, as I said in the previous slide, so you can ignore that. But this is assuming that you haven't done your measurements. So once you've joined, you will have the opportunity to join a set of working groups. This is not mandatory. You don't have to. But it is a place where you can listen to others in sport, you can raise questions, you can talk about challenges that you're having, and it's just a nice place to for sport to come together. Uh, they have been on hold because the UN were very busy with COP, but they are starting again, hopefully in the next month. So you will be given the option to join any of these working groups once you sign that letter. And you will also have access to a dedicated SharePoint site, SharePoint site online where you can go and look at all the documents and other useful information that other sport organisations have shared. So number two is to really measure, understand and make your baseline. And this is very important because this is what you will then be looking at your 50% reduction by. Now we do have a challenge in the middle of that called COVID um, and it is proving a challenge because all those signatories that have joined during COVID are having to look at their previous data from 2019 or 2018. Because obviously we cannot use the 2020 or this year data because your carbon footprint will be too low and then you'll never be able to um, make that 50% reduction. So we do need to spend a bit of time with you to help you and support you in collecting that data from pre-COVID time. 
So then the third one, so the obvious one, is then you need to act on it. You need to do what you've said you're going to do. Um, and really the first point here is that we need to look at avoiding things when we can. Just choose not to do something. Or priority, prioritise opportunities to avoid your carbon footprint. And this could be a, a number of things. I think COVID has taught us that it is OK to have a lot of online meetings, for example. Um, you can look at even how you get to your headquarters. There are lots of different ways that you can avoid. It could be avoiding buying something. Do you really need to give this particular gift to someone or something like that? Or can you make a more sustainable choice? Um, and to reduce, choose to do less. That could be in energy, for example, transport, materials and work practices. Substitute. So if you were, uh, well, I use the example of a gift. If you were buying a gift, could you actually substitute that for a sustainable gift that has a lot lower carbon footprint? And also at the same time, use that as a marketing tool to showcase, because I think a lot of people now in the public are really starting to demand that we are more sustainable in everything that you do. We have a lot of comments um, from this for the Olympic Games, actually, where athletes are gifted quite a lot. And a lot of them are pushing back at us, saying, we don't want this anymore. We want a sustainable gift instead. So there's lots of opportunities here. The fourth one is compensate or offset. Now, this is a very um, controversial point at the moment. A lot of people are against offsetting. Um, but I think it's important to note that for sports, we have to offset. We're never going to be in a situation between now and 2030 where we can just stop what we're doing. At the same time, we want our sports to grow. So we, have, we, have, we'll, we will have to compensate. The way that the IOC are doing it is through a project which you might have heard of called the Olympic Forest. This is um, in Senegal and Mali. And this is something that we are using from the IOC point of view to compensate our leftover carbon footprints. And the main aim of this is to also expand it so that any NOC from around the world can be part of it if you want to be. This won't be ready for probably one or two years time yet, but it is something that we want to open up and make available for you as well. If you don't want to be part of that, that's totally fine. It's your decision. There are lots of other options, but you just need to make sure that those options are certified by third party and really good quality offsets. There are quite um, a lot of projects out there who um, are planting trees, for example. Now, if that's not done in an organized manner and up to a really good standard, it's not going to count as your offsetting project. So it's very important to note that. Um, and then the fifth way is to monitor and report, which I've spoken about before, and we can support you through that. It's, it's quite an easy process. So the main other fourth step is to educate and inspire others. I think I've spoken about that um, enough, but this is really educating as many of your stakeholders as you can, your communities, your athletes, um, any sponsors that you have, for example, um, any way that you can, if you have events, what can you do to inspire others during that event as well? This can be whatever you want it to be. Every sport organization will educate and inspire others in a different way. So just to talk now about getting started and how we will support you. We are not assuming that you need to go through all of this alone. We realize that it's, it's quite a lot to do. Some of it's quite complicated. A lot of you don't have the resources in order to do this in terms of financial, but also in terms of technical support. So this is something where um, ourselves um, was particular Myself and Niels have come together to see exactly how we can support you now. So on one side, you will have technical support. So this is on one to one basis. You are all welcome to this. Um, the time is there for me to I will go through all of it with you again and every single step of the way. We will be holding more and more workshops and we also have guidelines. There's already a lot of guidelines available for you online. 
but um, we will be breaking these down and making them simpler for you as well. We have dedicated funding through Olympic Solidarity, which Niels, I'm gonna pass over to Niels in a minute so he can talk you through that. And then also we have, you'll see it coming out in the next week, hopefully, um, the IOC Climate Action Award. So this was run last year as well, and it's for this year as well. And this is where any of you who apply and meets a certain amount of crit criteria will win this award. So there's not a first place or a second place. It's basically every NOC who applies and meets the criteria will win this award. The award is some of those gold standard offsets. So that basically means that if you join the framework, if you commit to the reduction levels, and if you do a measurement of your carbon footprint, the IOC will give you your offsets so that basically you can be carbon neutral. So expect a letter. It will be coming out to all presidents and secretary generals of NOCs from James within the next week or so. You'll then have until the end of the year to, to basically meet those requirements and then we will award the award next year. Also to say that next year, it's, this award will carry on, but it's going to change slightly um, because this award was with our part, top partner, Dow, who, as I'm sure all of you know, are, have left us. So we're now putting it to all of our other top sponsors to see who is interested. We've had a lot of interest back so far, and we're looking at actually expanding this next year to make it a lot more exciting and have a lot more categories and it will be something where we will look to award it at the Olympic Games at an award ceremony um, for every Olympic Games. So hopefully that's exciting times ahead. So I'm just going to pass over to Niels, but before I do that, does any can I pick up any more questions? I can't see the chat, so I'm not sure. Uh, we do have a question, actually two now. Uh, one is from Cecil Tosetti. Uh, why not using the offset programs from the United Nations Climate Neutral now instead of the DAO ones? Um, so actually, the DAO ones are, um, it was specifically done with the top sponsor because they wanted to, to create this award with us. But they're not actually DAO offsets. So some of them are actually the UN dedicated climate offsets. There are some others um, because we wanted to have quite a range of offsets, um, not just one. And we wanted ones that would be more exciting to sports than some of the ones that the UN have. So that was the reason for that. But it was um, because of Dow, basically, because they were our top sponsor and they wanted to, to get those particular credits. You and we have another question. It's from Cecilia Viscara. How do you want sustainable development goals uh, fit in this climate action framework? And we would like to have the SDGs embedded in the five uh, overarching principles. Um, so the way that they are related is that basically the UN SDGs are sort of statements of where we need to get to in in life, in our societies. This framework is the action part of SDG for climate action. So this is more how to do it versus the SDGs of on a global level of where we want to get to. Oh, sorry, what was the second part? Could they be reflected in the principles? Uh, yes, so uh, let me go back here, sorry. Uh, we would like to have the SDGs embedded in the five overarching principles. Uh, well, the five overarching principles are already set. They're not our principles. They're the UN principles. They were the ones that decided on them. They were, are the ones that own them. So I don't think we can change them. However, um, if you read the text, I mean, it, it's from the UN. So obviously they do refer to the UN SDGs. Now, when you do your carbon plan and when you decide what you're doing with those principles, I 100% agree that you should link those actions in those principles to the UN SDGs because that's a global language that we're all speaking to. And I think it would be very a very great thing to do. So I agree when 
you do your carbon action plan, include them in the principles. Good. So now uh, I'll give the floor to Leonardo Cunha. So I invite him to uh, open his camera and open his mic to ask his questions and make some comments. Uh, hola, Gustavo. Muito obrigado por ter passado a palavra. Uh, hello, Julie. I hope you are okay. Hey. I haven't talked to you in a while, uh, but I'm always following your work. I would like to also to say hello to everybody that is attending. A lot of friends there. A lot of people that inspire me as well with their work. Uh, I've been following your work as well, so uh, it's really, really a uh, great satisfaction to be sharing this moment with you on such an important topic. So uh, I'll be uh, just right to it. Uh, sorry, I, I would have to take the floor because it's a lot of things and to write down would be a really long text. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much. As you know, the, the Cape Verdean NOC already is a signature on this, um, on this uh, climate action, uh, actually. Uh, we are very proud of that. It was uh, one of the first organizations to be a part of it. And we really feel this is the most important uh, pressing issue right now that uh, the world is facing. And uh, uh, considering that uh, Olympism, in fact, is a way, a philosophy of life for uh, human development, uh, this should be also an Olympic uh, priority, as you are stating with your presentation. But uh, in the few uh, weeks, months, probably in October, it was announced something really important based on the recommendation of Agenda 2020 plus five. Uh, that is the initiative. Uh, it's a recommendation number 10. It's the initiative of Olympism 365 strategy. Because if you know, this is an alignment of the strategy based on the direct alignment with the uh, sustainability objectives. As GDs, and uh, one of its the 13 is take urgent action to combat climate change. I was really happy to see this because this uh, the work. One of the working principles is to have a safe, inclusive, accessible, and sustainable organizations as a prerequisite to enable more equally opportunities. And this is um, policy making. So what the IOC is doing is giving guidelines for the stakeholders associated with it, what they should be doing, and we should take advantage of it. But I have a remark to do, and I think this is very important. The I have a working document on my desk. It's always with me. It's called Olympic Charter. And the Olympic Charter is a very important document for every organization or institution. This is aligned with uh, the Olympic movement. And if you check the Olympic Charter right now, the only place that you have the word sustainability is in Rule 33. Uh, it's based on the Olympic Games. And we are talking on a really broader challenge here. So I really think that it's really important for the people that are on this climate action uh, uh, consortium to also think on a, on a higher level and this to be inscripted on the most important documents that the IOC is managing with this, in this case, the Olympic Charter. This is the baseline charter for our work. So this is a recommendation and something for us to reflect on if it is important or not, just to uh, see these principles also uh, to be more um, directly uh, approached on the Olympic Charter. Another thing that I would like to also mention this is probably really important. And I think Niels will talk about this. And you already mentioned this in another presentation as well, is the opportunity that Olympic Solidarity will also uh, make available for the NOCs, for the programs that can be addressed on this issue. And I truly believe that every NOC should take advantage of it. As Niels knows, uh, Cape Verde NOC is trying to get advantage of the opportunities that the Olympic Solidarity is giving us. And uh, thank you very much for that. So you know that we are really grateful for the partnership that every time we uh, we make some initiative based on sustainability is really well accepted. So please, everybody that is joining us, take advantage of these opportunities as well. But I would like to point one, one thing that I think really works. It's like uh, 
everybody that is joining this, this framework uh, normally has some difficulties to know what, where to start. And I normally take advantage of every information that is available on the subject. And one thing that I do is a lot of benchmarking. And for instance, when I want to see uh, something associated with the Olympic values or Olympic values program, I go to Vita, she's joining us. So I mentioned you Vita, you know that I'm your fan or some other areas. I know that people are really, really doing a really nice job and can be an example for others. Uh, Olympic Solidarity has an initiative as well that is the Knock Exchange and also uh, has uh, made a platform that I regularly consult, for instance, uh, the documents that they have on strategic planning, human resources planning, the baseline documents that can be used and uh, based on toolkits. And when making available this type of, um, of opportunities, probably this uh, knowledge exchange programs could be an important one. I saw already that you are really focusing on making seminars, workshop, working on that, but reach out important or probably good examples of things that are already being done and could inspire other NOCs. Because personally, uh, on our level, on our organization, we are doing that. We are trying to find good examples like the one in Santome that are dealing with surf therapy and other countries that are on the Olympic movement. Sorry if I was too long, I didn't, didn't want to take a lot of time, but I think it was important to remind yeah. I brought up into the floor, okay? Th Thank th you. Thanks a lot for the contribution. Uh, we still need to give the floor to Nios, but I really appreciate it. I'm not sure if Julie wants to give uh, any comment. Um, just very quickly, nice to see you, Leonardo. Um, I think Olympic charts is a very good idea. I will not, I'm not too sure how easy that would be for me to change that, but I think it's a great idea. So I will take that forward. Um, just to let you know, in terms of your last point, um, this is something actually that I'm looking at to how can we actually have a train the trainer or exchange program going on within the NOCs. Um, and I've been speaking to Niels about that as well, actually, and that's something that we are going to progress over the next the coming year. Um, also, case studies. I did have a case study program going on, of which I invited NOCs to be part of, but I actually stopped it during COVID for various reasons. But I am looking to relaunch that in a different kind of format. So I that will happen as well. And, and any ideas that any of you have on how best for you to share and read about other NOCs, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Just let me know. Over to you, Niels. Thank you very much. And let me start also by thanking ANOC, uh, Gustavo and Andres for hosting this seminar here today. Thank you for the invitation to speak. And also to recognize the presence of uh, my colleagues, Joel and Marie, who are working on the NOC annual review, that is the engine for collecting data from the NOCs and that um, enabled us to invite some of the NOCs that are here today. And thanks obviously Julie for the excellent uh, introduction here to the Sports for Action Climate Framework. We, we here at the IOC, we're, we're doing what we can to support you in different ways, but it's really you who are the, the heroes here. We have over 80 people present from different countries. I know we have all the continents present today. I know it's way past midnight in Fiji Thanks, Lyndall, for staying up with us. Uh, you are the heroes. You're the ones that can make things happen here. We're only here to support you. As you know, I work on Olympic Solidarity's Olympic Values program, and we have $25 million to spend on promoting Olympic values. What is the Olympic values? Well, we interpret it as um, how we can use sport to create a better world. This is the vision of the IOC, to use sport to create a better world. Now, there are, of course, many things that you can do with sport to create a better world. But those of you who were in Crete, you will have heard that President Bach said that climate change is the primary challenge that we're facing right now as in you know, humanity. And we would like for all the NOCs to take leadership. Um, Julie and her colleagues have made sure that the IOC is making some really ambitious commitments. And we hope we can count on you also to take leadership in your countries. So uh, our solidarity program uh, dedicated to Olympic values, uh, I wanted to quickly explain our objectives uh, and then also how we can support you in terms of sustainability. Now, 
we would like for NOCs to be leaders. It means that um, we hope that you will ensure that your NOC is safe. We're talking mostly about safeguarding here. Sustainable, which is relating to what we're discussing here today. And inclusive, which is mostly relating to gender equality, but also non-discrimination of our other groups. If you're able to be all that, then you're going to be a, a credible promoter of these areas in your country. We call this organizational level change because there are changes that take place within your NOC or within other sports organizations. Now we also, through the program, try to support community level change. It's more going out into your communities, getting more people to do sport and be physically active, for example, or to promote Olympic education uh, or Olympic legacy and culture. If we can go to the next slide, um, I wanna focus on uh, the results areas that we have established for sustainability. We had one more slide, I believe, there, but... Um, yeah, I've got the same issue, so carry on talking and I'll reshare my screen, sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, but what we wanted to do in this quad was to be a bit more specific about what we mean when we support sustainability. So uh, in this case, we would like for all NOCs, if possible, to work with Julie to join this Sports for Climate Action Framework because we think it's a good starting point. We have uh, introduced a monitoring and evaluation system for solidarity for this cardinal plan. And we would like for as many NOCs as possible to join this framework and to measure and reduce carbon emissions. We think it's a good starting point because once an NOC has taken this kind of leadership, then it gives you credibility to also influence other stakeholders uh, in your country, whether it's event organizers or facility owners. Um, but I would like to focus primarily today on President Bach he said that the, the main challenge right now for us is climate change. And he would like NOCs to really take action here and to join this framework. We have, we have established three objectives in our program. We would like to focus on the first one here, which is to join this framework. So work with Julie. Olympic Solidarity is there to support you all along the way. Uh, we can provide almost any kind of financial support that you need. We can help you to reduce your emissions. We can help you do an audit of your NOC to understand where it is you're you know, having the most emissions and where you can reduce. We can help you to, to measure. We can even help to maybe install solar panels or other things to reduce emissions. But we would like you to start uh, by joining the framework and work with Julie, and we'll take it from there. So if we can all agree to that, I think that this will be the most efficient way for us to, to uh, take leadership here in the Olympic movement. And um, I, I don't have that much more to say. I know we only have a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll leave the floor again to, to my colleagues, uh, Gustavo and Andres and, and to Julie, and, or if any NOC has any question on this. Thank you. Fantastic. Then thanks a lot, uh, Niels. Does anybody has a question for Niels or our last one for Julie? No, last chance. <laughs> good. So I think we are very good on time. Uh, thanks a lot for Julie and News for uh, the presentations. And I think the message for the NOCs is great. I think the, the motive is clear for everybody, right? The world really needs action and sports can make a big play into this. And we do have all the technical knowledge that, which can be shared to the NOCs uh, with Julie. She's an expert, she has been there, she has supported a lot of organizations. And also now we have the funds through uh, Olympic Solidarity. So all it needs now is the, the will for the NOCs to join and all the support will be given. And this way uh, the Olympic movement and the NOC family will be able to make a positive contribution to the cause. So uh, thank you, thanks again uh, for, for you too. Thanks a lot for all the NOCs that join and all the participants. And thanks for the, uh, the interpreters as well, who are always helping us. And here's the emails for Julie and Niels. So please contact them. Uh, if you believe Anna can support you in any how, uh, we are on the same path. We joined the framework. We are now uh, doing our calculations and putting our strategy together. So let's all uh, make a difference. So thank you very much. Really appreciate having you guys here today and see you soon. Thank you, Gustavo, Andres. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much.